Now this should probably come as no surprise to you, but this week's text presents Jesus asking a question of his disciples. Who do people say that the Son of Man is? Some say John, the disciples respond. Some say Elijah. Some say some other prophet. But people were clearly talking. They were clearly looking for a Messiah. They were searching and waiting for one. And their desperation to find the Messiah, and I can't blame them there, leads them to hope that the Son of Man is already among them. That it might be John the Baptist or Jeremiah or one of the other moral people or prophets that were coming around or who they had heard of. They were desperate to find the one that they had been promised. And Jesus knew that there was some confusion, that people were identifying other people as this Messiah, but not Peter. Simon Peter, Simon the Rock, knew who the Son of Man was. So when Jesus asked him, he stepped up and immediately answered, You are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. Because of his faith, Peter is given the keys to the kingdom of heaven. And there begins the church. Jesus formed and entrusted his church to Peter and others like him who were willing to endure an incredible amount for their faith, even through persecution, even under the, under the duress of torture that faced religious leaders of that time, despite the almost promise of death. Early disciples and followers of Christ followed their faith until the end. And on them, on Peter, is built the church. Now here I wanted to say, and because of Peter's never-failing faith, the church's foundation has stood so that we are here today. But if I had said that, you would know most likely now that I mislead you. And when you hear the gospel next week, you would know it for sure. Because next week... After all of this, Peter takes all of this credit and all of these good vibes that he gets and goes and screws it all up by doubting Jesus to his face. So since I couldn't say that, what I will say is that the foundation that Jesus built the church on is a strong one. So strong that even some doubts, even questions, can't shake the foundation enough to topple it. It is a foundation that stands through time, even through Peter's doubts and our own. Our faith, Peter's faith, is strong enough to keep the church going, to solidify the foundation. And Peter is human, just like us. So it's natural that he had questions, that he went through periods of doubt, just like we do. But Peter's faith always pulled him through. And Peter's confession of faith here creates the foundation on which the church will grow. Peter's faith is one of the reasons that we are here right now. And the faith of Christians that come before us brought us through the past 2,000 or so years. Now, I was recently in England for our diocesan Bradford Youth Exchange, which is a program where we took eight high school students, all girls this time, to England to see our church's history, to get to know other youth in our sister diocese, and to engage in some tough conversations together. Now this is an every other year thing, so this year we took uh, students over there, and next year they'll send high school students to us. Um, so we get to show them our diocese and um, have conversations over here as well. But when we were in England, one day I found myself standing in the middle of abbey ruins from the 12th century in the North, Yorkshire, the North Yorkshire Moors. And I couldn't do anything but just stand there in awe at this massive stone structure. These abbeys, these ruins, were hauntingly beautiful remnants of earlier Christianity, of where we come from. Places that have been holy sites for generations and generations. Now, for those of you who have never seen these old abbeys, they are absolutely massive and beautiful. Henry VIII dissolved over 800 of these structures of different sizes, of course, in the middle of the 16th century, so, so a lot of them kind of lay in ruin now. Huge, empty, without their beautiful stained glass or other fancy markings, 
they still stand, the bare stone from which they were built. Now, when I found myself standing at the altar, or where the altar would have been, of Riveau Abbey, looking up at the brilliant blue sky, I was caught off guard. Not only because we saw about 12 hours of blue sky in the 17 days that we were in England, but because I was overwhelmed by a feeling of peace. I knew I was standing in a very holy place. This was, after all, a monastery where Christians had prayed centuries before and where people still walk and pray today. It's what they would call proper old, a kind of old that we don't get to see here in our country. And we were standing in a place where monks would have spent all of every day in prayer, communicating and being in relationship with God. And later we found ourselves at a different abbey called Bolton Abbey. And this one, though not as initially stunning, I thought, as Riveau, I was captivated for another reason. While half of it stood in ruin, like Riveau did, half of it is still used today as a priory church. Those footings still stand after all this time, and the nave is still used every Sunday. It really was incredible to see that juxtaposition. Places like Revo and Bolton Abbeys and many others, both used or all used differently today, but all centuries old, have had countless worshipers. Even through dissolution and destruction, they still stand in some form. Symbols of the faith of Christians from long ago and symbols of us today. And being in these ancient places had me thinking about the Christians that would have worshipped there, about the commitment that they made to Christ to hold to their faith. Because we are shaped by the faith of those who come before us. Now I imagine just like we do today, the monks in these abbeys pondered, probably struggled with the questions of Jesus, especially our question today. But who do you say that I am? I'm sure they wrestled with these questions, but they did it by being in relationship with God. Who do you say that Jesus is? When you really think about it, what would your answer be? Would you say that he was a good and moral man, a man who healed the sick and hung out with lepers? Would you have some other description? Sure, he is all of those things, but he is so much more. In the Nicene Creed, which we will recite in just a little bit, we say that Jesus is the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made. We say it every Sunday, but what does that actually mean? And what does it mean to us today? Who is Jesus to you? Is your faith something that you claim out loud every Sunday? Or is your faith something that you live out in your daily life? Who do you say that God is? I know that can be a daunting question. Jesus is the Son of Man and the Son of God sent by God to show us the all-encompassing love that God has for each one of us and for all of creation. And I also know that God can be so big that sometimes God can be hard to fully comprehend. But Jesus is like us, human. Jesus lived on this earth and was in relationship with us. That's what he was sent for to be an example of how God wants us to be. His heart aches for the marginalized, the ostracized, the disenfranchised. Jesus suffers when God's children suffer. He aches with those who suffer from mental illness. He's outraged when people use his name as an excuse to show hatred or bigotry. He cries out when lives are taken in senseless ways. In all of these things, Jesus is with us. But he also gives us a glimpse of the possibilities, the way things could and should be. Jesus stopped and healed the sick instead of walking by. He fed the poor instead of being afraid to be seen with them. 
He showed compassion to the unvalued instead of condemnation. Jesus called for change to unjust structures and showed love to those who lived in fear. He gave us the gift of ultimate forgiveness, and in the end, Jesus showed us that he was willing to die for us so that we may have a resurrected life after death. Jesus triumphed over death and created a world in which love can triumph over hate. So who do you say Jesus is? How do you proclaim that to the world? We can't really do it just by stating our faith in word, but we have to show it by living it in deed, by living out our faith in our lives. What God wants of us is to proclaim Jesus, the Son of God, the Messiah in our own lives, and to go out into the world and live it out, to stand with the oppressed, to call for change, to actively not love our neighbors as ourselves, all while relying on our faith and our relationship with God to guide us. Now we see these examples in people who stand up against white supremacy. We see this in people who aid refugees and people who volunteer with CYP and those who feed the poor. And I trust that we will see it in the people who drop everything to help the victims of Hurricane Harvey in Texas. We see these qualities in the people who stand up and they proclaim their faith in both word and deed. Like Peter, who was willing to put fear aside and follow his faith, who was willing to stand up and say, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. He showed that, his faith, he showed that faith in his life by being the rock that the church was built on, by living it out, not just in word, but in deed. So the question remains, how will you live out your answer when Jesus asks, who do you say that I am?